Hello, I'm Ricky. And I'm Joe. And this is Season 2, Episode 17 of the Baron Broadband Podcast, slated to come out on October 21st, 2019. And we got kind of a not-so-depressing group of topics this time. After we got done with that last podcast, man, I just kind of was like, oh, dude, I'm, I feel down now. Like, everything's going to hell, and, you know, like, we're all going to die. And I look at my pup, and, and, you know, like, I'm like, well, he still loves me. That's yeah, right. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Forever. Yeah. So um, let's talk about, we're doing whiskey this time. You know, whiskey's my thing. I love it. Not so much your thing, which I thought it was for the longest time. Well, I time. really like whiskey. I, I like rum a little bit better than whiskey, but if I had to say, like, my top three, it's rum, whiskey, and then probably vodka. Okay. Uh, I mean, still, it's like, you know, I, I, I know that you, you're not, you don't like it as much as I do, because whiskey is mm-hmm. my number one alcohol. Like, I, I love it. All different forms of whiskey, that's like my thing. Today, I got my, uh, one of my Flavi- Flaviar um, tasting boxes. Um, so, it's a, a, uh, Japanese whiskey selection. We have the Chida, the Kayo, and the Nika. Um, I haven't looked at the tasting notes for them. And then I also got the Johnny Walker White Walker um, limited edition Game of Thrones um, blended Scotch whiskey. Mm-hmm. Um, now I've had this before, so I know what this tastes like. Because I but. Yeah. All the same, um, it was like thirty bucks for a bottle. It was super mm-hmm. cheap, um, and I and I was just like, I, I got to get this. And I know you love Game of Thrones, so, yeah. Um, it, I'm interested to try them because if I'm remembering my history right, Japanese whiskeys are very similar to Scotch whiskeys because that's where they learned how to make whiskey from, wasn't it? There, there are some very similar. There is a lot of similarities, mm. um, but they don't have peat. So yeah. Scotch has to come from Scotland. And generally is has some sort of peat. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I know that I was saying it was just, I, the, the crafting style because it was somebody went to Scotland, lived in Scotland for a long time, and then came back to Japan and kind of brought whiskey to Japan. I don't one hundred percent know that, but I, I'm I'm fairly sure that's so, in some way, shape, form, or fashion accurate. Yeah. Um. So let's uh, let's start with the. Doom shot glass. Uh, so this is the Kayo. Um, and let's see what, what notes you get off of it. That's both of us tasting this, by the way. Yeah. Mm, that is a, that is a very... Yeah. There's a light, though. That's, that's like a vanilla oak. Yeah. A little bit... I don't want to say it's cinnamon, but it's one of those bark flavors. Not so, a whole whole lot out. I mean, it's just very like lightly toasted, some cinnamon, maybe a little bit of nutmeg. So it, it toasted oak. That's one of the things mm-hmm. that it gets there. I get that too. It has a berries flavor supposedly, spicy. I get the berries and the fruit. Um, get the smoky, uh, sherry. Monster. I don't know what that means. Um, sweet. It is definitely a sweet mm-hmm. whiskey. It is. And it has creamy vanilla in it, which you hit like mm-hmm. three or four of the things when you start talking about it. So yeah. I'd say that's uh, that's pretty neat. So it's the Cayo um, Suntory Whiskey Signature Japanese Mizunara. So I don't really know what that means because uh, I'm not big on Japanese whiskey yet. Mm-hmm. I've had it before. Uh, and I do, I do, I have liked it um, considerably, but that's what it says um, on here. So let's uh, let's wash this out, and we'll do the um, the next one um, in the doom glass, um, so we don't we don't kill our palate. Yeah. Well, no, there was a, a fun one for uh, for this. This is a tip I read online: is that when you really want to taste a little smaller flavors. Put some water in. That's why I'll yeah. serve a lot of fizz cubes with like a splash of water or one ice cube. And I could definitely get the sweetness. I didn't get berries as much. But when I was washing it out, yeah, there's some brightness there that the, you get from like darker berries, like a blackberry sort absolutely. of thing. And, and, and drinking a whiskey without anything to um, kind of cut it is uh, one of the things they say, if you really want to get the flavors, mm. uh, all the different flavors, it's best to cut it a little bit. Yeah. Like I might take one sip of, of this one 
With nothing in it, and then one with a little bit of water in it. Well, the the unfortunately, I couldn't find the water dropper. I was going to do that so we could put one drop of water in. Um, but uh, so this is the kai. This is the Nika. Um, the last was the Kaya. Hmm. Okay. Okay. That's a that that's a very different flavor. It is. It's very smooth. It's definitely very sweet. Still a lot of vanilla. Maybe a little bit of caramel in that. So that's a, another light taste, uh, light toasted oak. It's not bitter enough to be medium toasted. I don't think. So I I could definitely get the herbs mm -hmm. in it. It is a bit spicy. It's roasted. Is what they said. So yeah. well, you should get that. I, I get the roasted flavor, the oakiness. There's like a honey to it. I don't really get the sherry or the oiliness, and it says you should taste some grains in it. I don't. I didn't get the grains either, but maybe if I. Well, I mean, it's, if we're if we're talking about roasted grains, that's a caramelish flavor, um, and I definitely got the caramel. You can taste the vanilla. I wish it would tell you how charred the oak was, because that's a very much that tastes like a very light, taste. like a very light char. Well, yeah. this is so. Of all of them, this is the darkest, as you can tell. Mm -hmm. This is the second darkest. The lightest is the one we're about to try, yeah. which is the um, the Chitta. Um, that Suntory whiskey, single grain Japanese whiskey. So this is all from the same grain instead of instead of um, uh, multi grain. So. Mm. <laughs> you, you went for the oh, wrong one. Oh, down the line. Yeah. yeah. I drank the wrong one. Hold on. Let me clean my palate. <laughs> Skipping ahead to Well, drink. I went down the line. I forgot that we were we were filling one glass back up. Yeah. Now I put a little bit too much um, in there. You, you're sniffing the wrong one, too. Is it not the new glass? The, this is the new one. Oh, we just had that one. No, that's the one that you just, um, that, that you, you tasted them out of order. Okay, I've, I've messed up some. I thought we were doing Doom Glass to this one, then back to Doom Glass. We filled the Doom Glass back up. Because um, this is the one I, from the last review I just drank. And uh, stayed in my so, hand the so whole So we, we screwed that up. The whole the whole thing, I, I, I either messed up or you did. I think, no, I thought we were going back to Doom because this was in my hand the entire time. There's no way you filled that one back up. I, feel, I filled the Doom Glass back up. Okay, so we did the Doom Glass twice in a row. Yeah. Okay, then yeah, I already had this one in my hand. When we were talking. <laughs> so you filled it back up, and I just drank the one out of that. So maybe that's why I thought it was much lighter. Yeah, th this one is definitely a much lighter whiskey. Mm -hmm. So uh, you did the the Nick, the Nick Chitta, mm -hmm. is what it is. And, and uh, this one's got mango. I definitely get that. Yeah, yeah. I got Sweet, that. honey, lemon, caramel, savory, and some... some so it's, it's very fruity, and I like yeah, it. Yeah. It's, it's very it is fruity. very good. Yeah. It's a it's definitely a super fruity one. So okay, now yeah. now you're talking about the Nika. So yeah, taking the second one, that is much more roasted. That's yeah. probably a medium toast on that one. And it's not peaty, but it's a lot. It's a lot oakier. It's a lot. Well, of, they they don't have peat there, so that it yeah, wouldn't yeah. be peaty at all. But I know, but like a lot of people get peat and oak kind of mixed up on it. But it's got that like strong. Oh, I, don't, I still don't want to say that's a heavy charge because you don't get like the earthy notes as much. But that was a, the previous one was definitely a medium roast. Yeah, well, it's I mean I think it's a light, lightly roasted because the it's second one, the the one the one that you drank for the second one is this one. Oh yeah, and yeah, that's, I, that's the light. I'm talking one. about the one I just drank now, which was the second one you. Oh did. yes, okay, yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah, yeah so but, you just drank the Nika. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a matter of fact, guys, we just screwed this all up. Just just try all these whiskeys and don't listen to us at all because well we we got I'll it all wrong. This. They were all very good. They were all very good. Now it's time for us to. Try a Scotch whiskey. It's a blended um, malt Scotch whiskey. So I, I discovered that doesn't mean that this is a blend of different whiskeys. It means that they have a blend of grains that they put into it. Yeah, um, it can also be blends of the same whiskey that are aged at different rates. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is the Game of Thrones, and it's definitely a Scotch. I mean, there there mm. is such a different flavor between all of these. And uh, I've tried this both with a bit of water and without, and um, I am uh, super happy with the um, with the flavor of it. I love it with a little bit of water in it because mm -hmm. the the Johnny Walker uh, has like kind of um, a more scotchier 
kind mm-hmm. of kind of flavor to it. So I'm I'm super super happy with it. Yeah, it's not bad. Though I, I've realized having a lot more whiskey now because we do these podcasts and we hang out a lot. I like whiskey more than scotch. I think because of the peat. Yeah, I, I don't. I like raw, just pure oak more than I like oak mixed with other things. I got you. Well, so um, scotch is it, the the only thing that's different between scotch and whiskey, as far as like m- most of the things, mm. is that it's it's made in Scotland. There's a lot of them that don't even use peat. That's know. true. They, 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 there are ones that aren't peated. So, so th- this is yeah. not a peated. Really? Uh, so I'm, I'm it's pretty certainly sure. got, it's got a flavor to it that I couldn't place. Maybe it's just like a different type of oak. It, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's scotch and scotch gets, it's, it's a, the, the, the flavors of the grains that you're going to get from this are going to be different because of the terroir, terroir, however that's pronounced. The, the flavor, the, the earth imparts into mm-hmm. the grains that it's got. So it's going to be different. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that if, if I was going to get a sipping whiskey that mm-hmm. I was going to have it, as much as I like the Johnny Walker, Johnny Walker is not my favorite yeah. whiskey anyways. Um, I prefer scotch, mm-hmm. you know, um, and I would just go back to Glenn Le- LeVay. Yeah. Glenn Levitt, however they say it. But, um, but if, or Glenn Moranga, mm-hmm. Morangi. Moringa. <laughs> I am so bad at pronouncing those names. But um, if if I had to choose a Japanese whiskey, I really like that Chitta whiskey. Which was the... The, the, the very light one. The one okay, that had yeah. all the The actual flavors. third one? Yeah, yeah, the actual third one. Yeah, I gotta agree with that. That was my favorite out of the group as well. And I'm gonna have to go look and see if I can find a bottle of that. Because that, that's a really good sipping whiskey. They definitely sell it on uh, Flaviar. So you can mm-hmm. get it from there. Uh, not that that you know, no endorsement from Flaviar or anything like that. I just bought these off of there. I didn't. Uh, yeah. I don't get anything from them <laughs> or anything like that. Um, so let's talk about these uh, Target cube shelves. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you talked about those a little while ago that you were excited for them. Well, because they were so much less expensive. Yeah. yeah. Um, without a back on them, they mm-hmm. would like. Woo, yeah, yeah, woo, yeah, Like yeah. side to side. These won't. The ones right here, mm-hmm. they'll stand up on their own. Especially if you like put them to a wall or something, they're, yeah. they're just pretty much rock solid. So I say these. I'm talking about my original yeah, IKEA, IKEA didn't need a back shelf. Those needed a back. The target ones needed a back to make it stable. And yeah. I had to put a fairly significant firm back on it. Okay. Did they? Now that the question is, did they come with one? No. Okay. Then yeah, that's a pretty big design hit. I, I would not buy them again. Okay. I mean, I, I spent. I, I they're they're much less expensive, and I planned on putting a back on them to begin mm-hmm. with. Now the four cubes shelf, super sturdy, works great. But the um, the sixteen or the twelve cube and the um, four cube, or no, this is a sixteen cube. I'm sorry. Yeah. And that one's a four cube tall, not a four cube. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cubed um, shelf. Four by four. Well, four. Yeah. So I've got that one right here in the back. The four. The four. Yeah. So there's a four by four over there. That's. I mean, there's, there's a um, four by one over there. Oh, okay. The okay, so it's this 12 one, and a, Okay, gotcha. This, this one is 4x4. Four four. Mm-hmm. I put the 4x4 four four and the 4x1 together and then gave them a yeah. common back. Okay. Um, they, that, that made both of them super sturdy. The 4x1 is fine. It works mm-hmm. as, a good, as a good shelving unit. The 4x4, four four, though, is just it's not very good. It's too good. wobbly. Yeah, and, and um, it just it, it was difficult to, to keep together, all that other stuff. It just uh, the... the they ripped off the IKEA design. I don't know how they're doing it, and IKEA not suing the pants off of them. But maybe they like. Oh, that stuff is super complicated. Yeah. It's. Uh, I was talking to a guy once who he did car design, and um, you know he said this really fits for like any design for something that's physically constructed in like a factory. To get around uh, like patents is super easy because you just use slightly different parts like you can take the exact same design you can look at those two shelves say those are the same shelves but one uses flathead and one uses phillips and they're different units okay you know well they they use all the same material the same like type of dials and stuff mm-hmm. they're just slightly different sizes yep but there you go. The, but this is a this is a much less the, the target shelf is much mm-hmm. less sturdy it has to be connected to something to keep it sturdiness. Yeah. Okay. Where this one could stand up on its own in the middle of my room, and the the four by four could do the same mm-hmm. thing, and it would be just fine. 
Um, yeah. I wonder how they connect them because just knowing how the physics of those things work, you know, what makes like a piece of freestanding furniture sturdy is that it's got resistance on kind of like all axes when it tries to move. So for that one to not be sturdy, they have somewhere got more force applying it like in one direction than the other. Well, it does. So this one, um, the it's just, they're assembled the exact same way, mm -hmm. but this one has thicker dowels and thicker bolts that hold it together. Yeah. This one has smaller dowels and everything, and I think that's the difference. Yeah. Just the resistance uh, in the material is high. Otherwise, they're the same thickness, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean. There's also the chance that, like, what you can't see, the inside of those past a certain amount is hollow. And so that wouldn't give both them of, resistance. Both of them are. Oh, really? Yeah, they're both, they're both hollow. Um, it, it really is just that this one is has smaller, mm -hmm. smaller pieces with bigger holes that okay. they go into. And this one fits more snugly into okay. it together. But um, this, this thing, once I put the back on it, it's fine. Uh, and it'll freestand. It's not designed to freestand. It's designed to go up against a wall. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I had the same problem with those shelves. Mm -hmm. Without being attached to the wall, they wobble. Hmm. Um, they don't. They they don't hold themselves together. If I ever move and take yeah. them out, uh, they're just going in the garbage. They're okay. not. They're not. Uh, they're not designed. Yeah. To... I, it's. I get really conflicted about stuff like that because on one hand, a person who maybe wouldn't be able to afford an IKEA shelf can afford the Target shelf. Right. There's something to be said about availability at a scale of price points. But at the same time, like I feel like our furniture market is kind of collapsing in on itself where you've got the really expensive high-end furniture and then you've got like crappy furniture but no place in between. Like a lot of the stuff that like my mother keeps bringing in because you know, she's moving in with us. Mm -hmm. Oh, I bought this this bookshelf on Amazon, and it's like, okay, well, yeah, it was about fifty bucks cheaper than the bookshelf that we bought at a furniture store, but it's just complete crap. Like even with the little back it comes with on it, it's you know bowing and bucking, can't hold children's books well. Whereas like, you know, we went to a discount furniture store and got a solid wood, you know, no particle board or anything like that bookshelf for just a little bit more. And it's like, why, why does this particle board one need to exist? Why can't well, we just... So, but that, that's exactly kind of what I'm getting at, is mm -hmm. that this, this is like um, $160. Yeah. This was 100 roughly. Yeah, they're really not even that much cheaper. I, in yeah. my head, when we were saying, oh, the Target shelves are much cheaper, I was thinking of like the little nightstand we got from Target that was like 25 bucks. Yeah. You know, if it was like a 40 buck bookshelf, it's like, okay, I don't expect it to be as good as 160. And maybe I can understand, you know, someone could afford the 40, but not the 160. But you're saying 100 bucks for this versus 150 for this other one. And the Target one needed modification to be usable. It's not really actually 100 bucks. It's 100 bucks plus whatever you had yeah, to spend exactly. to get it stable. Now, I mean, I already planned on having that happen because mm. I, I wouldn't even put these in, in the center of the room without a back on them because yeah. I wanted to have. Um, stuff attached to the back of it mm -hmm. so that 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 was designed that way i wanted i wanted the aesthetic of the cube shelves because mm -hmm. they fit with everything else that i've got in this room but all that said it just did it, it doesn't it doesn't work like it's supposed to yeah so that that's not cool i don't recommend them don't get them you know don't, don't get the four by four if you're yeah. going to get the four by one or the four or the two by two that's totally cool um i wouldn't get the three by Three by four, three by three, anything like that, mm -hmm. because that I, I mean, I had to reinforce them, and and it, you know, for anybody that's like, well, you know, you just didn't put them together right or whatever. Like I use glue, I I put in metal brackets yeah. around it to reinforce it. Uh, the big mistake that we made, <laughs> funny story, wife and I put this together. We put mm -hmm. it together downstairs because we were like, well, you know, we're gonna have to attach it back and all this other yeah, stuff. Yeah. We didn't think about that that the staircase because we yeah, measured the staircase that's below. Area. Yeah. Is is much wider than the staircase up here, mm -hmm. so the staircase below that fits into the same sort of stairwell had a wider opening, yeah. had like all this other stuff. Works worked really super well to be able to do all the things that we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Staircase up here, we just tore up the wall and almost destroyed the shelf. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, <laughs> how'd you get it up here? I guess if we went up the stairs, I, I thought that you had. Uh like attach something to it and pull it up just over 
Uh, well, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have held together to do that. It would that's have fallen true. Apart. It's not stable enough. Yeah. So, I I mean I, that's that's what I would have done if mm-hmm. it was stable enough and yeah. I had all the straps and everything to do it. Still would have tore up the wall. Yeah. Um. So like it's it was just a comedy of errors. When you, when you go back downstairs, you can see. Yeah, I saw the, on the, the way up. I just didn't I didn't remember <laughs> if that was there before. Or not. At one point, we had it stuck into the walls uh-huh. on both sides, and we couldn't get it to move. Ooh. Yeah. We just had to like kind of like manhandle it through. There's a big tear on this yeah, wall yeah. and a big gash in that wall that I'm gonna have to fix and repaint and everything. So, fun times at the Bradley household. Um, all right, so PS4 games streaming to Android and iOS devices. Um, so the PlayStation 4 mm-hmm. always had this to their Sony Xperia phones, where you can mm-hmm. like like the. Uh, the, like you used to be able to do where you could stream games to your PS Vita yeah. and stuff like that. Super awesome like technology. Mm-hmm. Love game streaming. I don't really know how you feel about it. No, in a situation like that where we're saying I'm streaming from my console to another device in my house, love it. Because it eliminates my big concern about it. When we talked about like the Stadia and the, the Mac gaming and stuff like that. My big concern is going over the internet. We don't in enough of the country have the infrastructure for I feel like it work really well. Mm-hmm. But absolutely, you know, in your house you have the ability to stream from one device to the other fairly well. Maybe if you're in an apartment complex it gets a little rough because there's a hundred networks around you. But, you know, if you've got a decent home Wi Fi set up, you can stream to anything and it's not it'll be some delay. But not to I think a degree that's like game changing. Well, so, but now you compare the controllers mm-hmm. with iOS 13 and, and Android 10 Android. Okay. to your device and be able to use them with, so like you're streaming, it's just like you have a remote screen yeah. and you're able to use the... the no, that's awesome. I and, love that. Yeah, that, that is, it is, it is awesome. I love it. I, I, I prefer it on the iPad or mm-hmm. tablet versus um, something like... A, um, uh, a phone because mm-hmm. as cool as cool as it is to be able to play those games on a phone and there is some coolness sometimes the details are just a little bit too small yeah. for me so I prefer a tablet size screen so like a nice mm-hmm. 10 inch screen but I, I mean tot- it is totally cool being able to play something like The Witcher or something like that on um, my tablet amazing being able to play Spider-Man um, PS4 version. Oh yeah, Spider-Man. I mean, there's so many awesome. good uses for it. You know, you got a multi-story house, you've got a delivery coming in. Everybody knows how UPS and FedEx are. They show up at your door, they slap on a sticker, they walk away. Half yep. the time, they don't even knock. It's a perfect opportunity for you to sit downstairs and play your PC games on your bottom floor because you can just stream it from your computer that's upstairs to your tablet downstairs. Well, that I mean, that's the that that is not the PS4 streaming. That's that's the console. Uh, but uh, well, that's the, true. The, uh, yeah, instead yeah. of your computer, your your console. Yeah, the same concept. You know, you get more mobility in your house out of your game. Love that. Yeah, I, I mean, I love being able to have my super powerful computers up here mm-hmm. and stream them to my Nvidia Shield or my. Um, I, I do prefer the st- the streaming built into the Steam um, Steam Link. Yeah, and I hate that that was a discontinued item. I mm-hmm. still use it like yeah. all all the time, um, but. Yeah, uh, having having Steam streaming in my house is great. This is just like the next level of things that I can do. It, it, it at whatever point I get where I can have a tablet that mm-hmm. lets me stream, lets me plug into my TV set downstairs and will let me stream from my PS4 up here down to that. That is the yeah, um, yeah holy grail of that. So I'm looking forward to some sort of you know. Um, set up like that at some point in time. I mean the the technically you could do it with something like uh the Nintendo Switch uh if it was running Android and and you put the PS4 mm. you know thing on it. So that's pretty cool. Um so let's talk about Space Meat. Space Meat. Um okay. it, <laughs> it, well so I don't know if you you watch Invader Zim, but there's an episode where oh, they yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. space meat. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, there's a company called Ala Farms that um, you know we, we've talked about the Impossible Burger before, and some of the other things like that that are. And I don't remember all the names of the different different types of one, but they're basically plant or some sort of lab grown mm-hmm. uh, meat that's mostly based off of like enzymes and things like that. Yeah. 
This is actual beef that was grown um, out of like you know cells that yeah, were harvested, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, they were able to take it up to the International Space Station and get it to grow in space. Mm, yeah. So this would be a way to have uh, pro like like animal proteins without killing animals, which is mm. great. Um, it seems to be fairly. Um, you know, has has less of an impact. Um, I, I don't know what the impact of, of creating the chemicals and everything are, yeah. but um, yeah. So, what what do you think about that? Like, what's kind of your take on it? I okay. So, I've got a really good take on the science because the ability to grow particular cells in really any environment is super super valuable. Um, the idea that we could grow screen grafts, the idea that we could, you know, someone has a particular injury, you know, just like uh, there's lots of all that goes about stem cells and like the stem cells of um, like early ones because there's multiple stages and there's the whole political thing about that. But, like stem cells always exist. Like you got stem cells in your bodies right now. Right. It's just your stem cells are then specialized. And the idea that we could grow you know, particular substrains and say, okay, well, we need X or we need Y. Super great. Um, in terms of, like, scaling up to, like, commercial, could we use this for food? Not as hot about that. Really, when we start talking about nutrition, a big benefit of animal proteins is they are complete proteins. Um, you know, a piece of chicken has every single one of your amino acids in it, as opposed to, like, the protein from soy, which does not have all the amino acids mm -hmm. in yeah. it. You have to mix things around. I don't know when we start talking about efficiency if going into a cell growing process for a complete protein is necessarily more efficient or more beneficial than growing a variety of a, of like incomplete proteins. Well, so the I think that this would be like you'd have to do a mixture of both things to be able to have something that that works out because there's going to be people that are going to say, well, it's still it's still meat. And I'm not going to eat meat because that's wrong. They have a moral mm -hmm. uh, you know, thing. So you you, have, you just have to have those incomplete proteins. Incomplete proteins, though, it's harder to have a diet where, you, where you're balanced uh, when you completely go off of animal proteins, like complete proteins. I don't think that's true when we start talking about I, practical applications. I, I, get me on this. So when we're right. saying, like, an average diet to a vegetarian diet, boom, you're here on Earth, normal. Absolutely, you are a hundred percent right. You know, just the average person just picking out their food, what's easier to balance, having a chicken breast every day, or saying, I'm gonna get this amount of soy, maybe this amount of bean, maybe this amount of lentils. Mm -hmm. It's definitely more difficult to do the latter. But when we start talking about, hey, we can grow this in space, we can put this on space colonies, those are so manufactured to begin with and so many balanced things where you're looking at two different plants and saying okay what are the byproducts of the growing process like what are they putting in the air is how grain we got have to get I don't think at that point it's going to be difficult because realistically up in space very strict and regimen diet be even worse on colonies um the protein itself is not the part you worry about. It's how much energy does it take to grow the beef uh, as opposed to growing the soy plant and well, that sort of stuff. I mean, actually, they they created a whole steak, mm -hmm. in, like basically a, a steak yeah. size um, meat in, in, in space, um, and it took less effort than it would have to make, um, you know, some sort of plant-based thing like growing mm -hmm. soy or something like that because you know hydroponics is very very hard to manage in in some sort of environment like you know zero gravity or something like that yeah but we're, we're past that point though right like I, I get what you're saying like i'm growing a soy plant i'm doing hydroponics but when we start talking that we're doing protein synthesis we're doing cell division and controlled environment you know how hard is it to grow the soy molecules as opposed to the uh, the protein chains for like because it's if it's beef like we're not talking about they made generic protein 
we're talking about they made a steak. Like, are we are we saying it's actually like a beef steak? Like this is it's it's it's, it's yeah. But it, there's it a, is. a ton of stuff in that that's not just the raw protein. And I think that's where the the debate is. Um, which of those is more efficient to grow a plant protein or to grow an animal protein? Yeah, and, and just, I don't I yeah. don't know I don't I, know I don't if, know either. I just I looked into it really heavily like a year and a half ago. I guess maybe that's when they started the experiment. And now they that, finished it. That well, no, but, that, that this was just like the so they they proved that they could do it on Earth. Mm-hmm. Um, they proved that they, and they've been making meat that's like that they're putting out there for people to consume uh, here on Earth that's lab grown. Okay, uh, so they started really yeah. The the, the research yeah. I did on it was when they were just releasing the lab stuff. Yeah, it's about like about two years ago is, yeah. is when they were doing it. But now you can buy the Impossible Burger at mm-hmm. fast food restaurants. And the this is a little, this this company, Aleph, is a little bit behind some of the other companies as far as like mm-hmm. being able to mass produce this stuff, but it's coming. So we, we should be able to buy things like that in grocery stores soon and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, so as there's more consumer adoption to it. That will make it cheaper. But then looking at it as something that you could sell like to... A government agency or something. Yeah. This is this is an important step toward that uh, for them. And it wasn't something that they grew over like two years or something yeah. like that. It was like we, you know, we grew this in like mm-hmm. ten days or something. I don't yeah. know exactly the time period. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. On that, it's an interesting <laughs> sell on the idea that yes, this is beef, and yes, this is beef that didn't have to have an animal attached to it. But the flip side, we already are taking such big steps that people are kind of not liking really the completely tame genetic modification we do to like plants we grow you know there's the big horror story of like oh this is part rat but really it's like well no we just kind of spliced this one little thing out of it we put this one little gene back in to make it more frost resistant you know we get people talking about that stuff all the time is that good for you and now we're just saying well here's the thing that was 100% grown in a lab well so while while I'm all you know Mm. with you on those things and then you know being able to grow the the plant based stuff it makes it makes it a little bit different the the thing that i that i basically get out of this though is that we can get away from some of the things that we do that pollute the most which is you know growing um, and having that's true i mean it's, it's a different game on earth like when yeah. we start saying mm-hmm. uh, where does the meat you and me eat here in our homes come from you know, that's a different topic. And I'm interested to see kind of where the consumer world goes with that. Considering we're already sometimes, and I know it's not everybody, I'm not even one of the people that fight it, but, you know, because I think, you know, there's really no harm in a lot of the, the genetically modified stuff we eat. But there's absolutely subsets of people that want to eat less and less modified stuff that then say, here's a 100% modified product that, like, could not ever exist naturally. You know, what's their adoption rate looking for? You know, when we start talking about space and colonies and stuff, it becomes uh, a different battle of right. what is just purely the most efficient because that's yeah. what matters in those environments. And, and I don't, I don't know. I mean, I definitely haven't. Uh, as much as I follow this stuff, I haven't mm-hmm. heard anything about. Um, I wish we really won't from the yeah. space station. I mean, the important thing to know about the space station: a lot of people kind of treat it like Colony 1.0, which it's it's not. Yeah. The the space station is purely meant for. Scientific discovery and testing. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. that's what it's there for. It does a great job at it, but uh, so yeah, we might not get the answer from the space station of okay, if we scale this up to a colony, which is the most efficient. You know, that's kind of for now the science is known. We'd, and the data we'd have is to gathered. have like a, a moon base or something. Well, no, this is for people to do afterwards. I mean, it's like the space station is kind of where the experiments happen. The analytics of that kind of happens later on Earth. You know, it's yeah. like saying we've proven a hypothesis. Here's all our data. It will probably take us two years to scrub through it, and anything that looks great will retest and stuff like that. So you know, a decision will, will come on that later. It's cool to see that they were able to grow it. I don't think there was a. I guess there's always some concern because you, you know how gravity and certain other like low resource stuff works, but just the science for how protein synthesis happens, it shouldn't be harder to do in space than just to do it on Earth. So I'm not too surprised to see that it worked okay. I think it's just how much resource, like, how efficient could we get it to be? Did it ever surpass growing something or surpass doing synthesis of an, of an incomplete protein? So, 
I, I don't really know anything <laughs> more about that. So let's talk about the Google Stream Transfer. I, I kind of mm -hmm. demoed this yeah, for yeah. you earlier. So um, I, I don't really have to go into much detail for you, but just for listeners, basically Google has a new feature of its um, um, Google Play yeah. or Google um, uh, the Chromecast, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Chromecast audio and Chromecast, where you can take a, some streamed audio or something that's being streamed to one device mm -hmm. and stream it to another. Now, I have, like, zones set up in my house where I'm like, you know, I say the, the buzzword mm -hmm. and then, um, you know, it, it will do my whole house or it'll do a floor or it'll do, like, a room, you know, and stuff like that. So I... Um, now, you know, like earlier today, I told it to do it all throughout my house uh, for you, mm -hmm. and then um, I told it to just do the um, the bottom floor, and it, you know, it did. It yeah. switched it over to it, which is a really neat feature that hasn't been around. I think um, that that is one of the things that the Amazon um, devices, that the, mm -hmm. their streaming devices like the... the uh, Dot and, yeah, and yeah. the echoes and stuff like that. Those, those have have that uh, a, or a similar ability um, to to switch between. But you yeah, couldn't tell yeah. it to switch to do to a certain group. Um, so that so I haven't used that 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 echo in a while that I have. Yeah, it was a little interesting to hear they hadn't they didn't have it, but it is cool to see that they do have it now. Before, were you able to? Basically, just not do the transfer. So you could say, "Hey, do it everywhere," and then you have to say, "Okay, well, stop now. Do it just upstairs." As or just to doing the just redirect. you just say, "Play here," and it would just mm -hmm. it would just it start play playing, there. but it wouldn't okay. pick up where it left off. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I mean, that's a cool feature to have. I feel like that was a good low hanging fruit for them to throw in. It, it's you know not probably a high effort feature, but it's nice to have because it's, it's kind of how people want to use it. Maybe not. I mean, uh, lo looking at the complexity of something like that, thinking about how it could be low-hanging fruit, um, being able to... So if, if it was just, it started like the song over or something like that, mm -hmm. and it had like some sort of caveat, but it literally just picks up where it left yeah, off. Yeah, but that's a super easy thing to do. The the Because it already has to have the ability to do that because you can pause it, move to other tasks, and resume. It has timestamps of like where it is. It's really just about taking the cue of the command and then pulling the data of like the current state and then just feeding that into the command to another one. Like it's not in the sense that like it's a super easy feature and like, oh, was, they should have had it already. But you're essentially just taking commands that have already been recorded, pushing them to a separate section of devices and then just feeding in a couple extra data parameters. Kind of the same way of like, you know how you can, you can take a YouTube video and resume it from anywhere, or send it to somebody and it resumes at a particular spot because in their, basically, whatever they're using for their call, whether it's like just um, HTTP or it's like JSON or whatever, there's just a field to say, okay, and it then start at this timestamp. Yeah. And you well, the, the timestamping definitely is a feature that they've, they've had for a while with YouTube mm -hmm. videos. Being able to like do it on like Netflix or mm -hmm. something that's outside. So, you know, we were using Spotify yeah. at, at that point. Um, but it, something that's a built-in Google service, I mm -hmm. see as that probably being more trivial. Being able to pick that out of like a partner service or a service that's not a partner but just has the cast feature built into it, mm -hmm. I see being more difficult. Maybe. I, I mean, I don't know all streaming services, but everyone that we've used so like spotify google play youtube music all of those support time stamping yeah um because you can share songs with people and only give them like the chunk that you want them to, to have well i i mean i suppose so i i still think it is one of the it coolest cool features feature. that 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 i have availability to i don't know that i'll use it all the time but there are moments where you know uh, my wife she'll like want to listen to something and she just turns it on in the whole house yeah um because she forgets to say to play it in just the, like, the bedroom stairs, or yeah. play it you know like downstairs or something and so then it'll you know start playing mm -hmm. for me but then uh you know if she I, I can just say change the you know cast it just to this and yeah. it just picks right up well i feel like you know every update with software generally contains a lot of updates um but most of them are not super useful to everybody. You know, it's a lot of niche things. Okay, well, we changed these 
display types. And the people that didn't like the other displays, oh, cool, we've got these new ones. The people that like the originals, okay, well, not a big deal. A lot of bug fixes, which, you know, if you were one of the people affected by that bug, that's great. If you're one of the people that's not, eh, not a big thing. But this is something I feel anyone that has multiple streaming devices gets just intrinsic value out of. Like, any, if you've got more than one, this is a good feature. Because yeah. now your stuff can move with you at the state it was when you left the other area. It's just all around good. Like, this is something everybody can use and everybody can benefit from. Which is what kind of why I like it so much as a feature. Yeah, you know? exactly. There's no corner cases to that. This is, the, this is just 100% everyone could use this if they have more than one device. So let's talk about the Nintendo Switch Lite. Now, yeah. I have a Switch. Did you ever get a Switch? We are we are currently saving up for a Switch. We are planning to get it on the Black Friday sales. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I have a Switch. Uh, there's going to be a new revision of the Switch that's mm -hmm. going to come out. I love my Switch. I play on it all the time. It does have yeah. kind of, like, very short battery life, but you mm -hmm. can solve that by getting a bat battery bank or, mm -hmm. you know, plugging it up to you know, wall power or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, that said... The light has better battery power. It's a few hours more hmm. um, off the basic battery power. It's you know not. It doesn't play on your TV set. It's only a handheld console. Yeah. Um, it doesn't really replace the 3DS because it doesn't play those games necessarily. There mm -hmm. are some of them that, that you can uh, play on there, um, but it has most of the single player features that the Nintendo Switch had without having yeah. the removable controllers and being mm -hmm. able to play things like Splatoon and stuff like that with it. So, or 1-2 Switch. What do you think about the Nintendo Switch Lite? Do you, do you think that you would rather have that than a Switch? or No, I, I think the Switch does more. I'm really conflicted about it because I feel like it, it doesn't cement somewhere the product super well unless it is a testing ground for them to make changes in the future. So, like, right now, it's not a, a, a good one-to-one -one replacement of the 3DS. It doesn't play the same games. Um, it's mobile, but it's a, a much larger size. It's not quite as the portable thing that a 3DS can be. It is much more portable, though, according to everyone that uses it, than the Switch. It is. It is much more portable than the Switch. But it's not as portable as their other portable flagship. It's got a lot of the good stuff of the switch but it can't really then fill the other area of the switch like you couldn't then just like buy a base station later and use it with your tv like that sort of thing i'm really interested in the idea of it being this middle ground for testing because i could very much see nintendo switching to a more modular console that maybe they're really trying to nail down what's the perfect size and feel for a the portable switch part and then they don't have a 3DS and a Switch. They've got Switch Portable and like Switch Base. And the idea is if you just want the portable gaming, just buy the portable part. You want the console gaming? Okay, well, go get the base station and maybe we sell two little controllers that click into the side or, you know, things like that. Because that could be a very good direction to go of, well, what if we had a console that really could have two or three different modes and if you only wanted one or two of those modes, you could only buy the parts that were needed for it. Well, I mean, they didn't do that with the Switch, but that's kind of the idea behind the Switch. Yeah, that was kind of the idea Switch. that didn't really, I think, play out as well as they wanted to. I think a lot of people enjoy... Like most of the people I know that use the portable parts of it are doing it for very small trips because they don't have a super long battery life, or they're using it to play around their house. Or, you know, I'm going to you know, plop my Switch, I'm going to go play in bed. Instead of playing in the living room. That's, and that's how I see most people using their portable parts to it. I'd like the idea of they're really trying to invest in that it could be a more substantial portable. And, you know, I don't know. I just feel like the Switch missed the base on being this two-in-one console. It's a great console. See, but I, everybody that I know that uses it uses it like I do. Um, at home, it, uh, it, it's rarely ever docked. Mm -hmm. It goes around with you, uh, but you have to plug it into something, a battery bank or yeah. or wall power, uh, and you use it, you just use it in different locations in your house. Um, but when you go on a trip, that's when it really shines because you can carry that device with all your saved progress mm -hmm. and everything like that on the trip with you, 
and you've got the ability to you know play offline or online whatever thing you're going to play and so you've got you know like i went um to a party in greensboro mm -hmm. you know a, a while back and i took it with me and while i was you know not doing anything i was able to play some switch games yeah uh and that was a lot of fun just th and i'm not just discounting your experience <clears throat> with it but i just don't know anybody else that plays it that way i think I know, like, I know a lot of people that just play it around the house. That you know, I'm going to go play in my, my bedroom. I don't know too many other people that travel with it, but also most of the other people I know are not very tech savvy. They don't have a battery bank. They don't really have some way to extend the battery life on like a long trip. So that and that's interesting because everybody else that I know mm -hmm. uses exactly how I do. Really? Yeah. How technical are they? They're not very. No, there's, I a, just know. There, there's some people that aren't very. Okay, they don't, so they don't necessarily like carry the battery bank. So, mm -hmm. Some people do, some people don't. I think, but I think that the Switch um, it is that perfect you know, blend. Mm -hmm. It just it, it doesn't have the battery life that I'd love to see. And they've got yeah. a new revision coming out that probably will have it. But I think the Switch Lite, um, where it shines and falls apart, is the ability to have. Like, if you need to go pack light, but you still want to be able to carry something like that, you've got the Switch. Yeah. And the Switch is just like a couple more ounces heavy. It's a little bit bulkier. But if you've got to have, like, you know, a smaller case, you need to be able to just carry, like, three games, a couple of things like that. You Or maybe you just want to be able to have one game that's, that's inserted and the rest of them are, you know, like, on the Switch yeah. itself. Um, then you, you've got all that stuff there. The problem is, for me, in between these two things, is that if I want to play a game from my Switch, it doesn't have like an ability to cross the saves between the two yeah. devices. So I'd have to find some janky way to move my save from this device over to this mm -hmm. one, or something like that. And that that's a problem for me. But other than that, I totally see a purpose for the Switch Lite, especially for people that only use it as an on-the-go device. They never carry it. They never like really play it mm -hmm. in their house. They they uh, undock it, carry it with them everywhere. Um, so I I mean I can totally see the Switch Lite as a viable product. And I've seen some YouTubers who are like, I love this thing. I love I I love it even more. Mm -hmm. And I I mean I'll admit I want one because of my tech addiction. Yeah, uh, and my gadget addiction, but I think that since I have, I I have all my save game progress and everything on my Switch, I really can't see there being much of a purpose for the Switch Lite, other than just a new kind of gadget for me. Yeah, so owning a Switch already and being fairly strong enough to be able to like hold it up mm -hmm. wherever I am, no no big deal. Unless the Switch Lite has something that it brings to the table that the switch doesn't mm -hmm. uh, at some point in time it just feels more like a lighter thing for somebody who doesn't want to carry as much weight around when yeah. they're portable basically um, so yeah I mean I, I think we kind of agree on that it's not I, I, I don't know that I'd I'm, I'm going to buy one but I kind of want one <laughs> yeah well we debated it for a while um, we, we decided we did want the, the full switch but yeah it, it's an interesting product to me <clears throat> I don't dislike it, but I'm also like, it's not a must buy. Yeah. It's a very much, I I'm, I'm kind of want to see where this takes their market. The, I, th I, I think that the Switch Lite might eventually replace the 3DS. Yeah. yeah. That, that's what I was kind of feeling when I saw a release. Like, okay, is this just them really trying to nail down another good portable? Because I think their, their 3D technology has kind of become just them. You know, they released the 3DS in a time where. 3D was still really like budding, and the question was, how do you do it? And kind of the market split into these these headsets, and not as much on the the thing you see. Yeah. Because the 3DS, the 3D is not bad, but it is it is not as good as a headset 3D, and you can't play it as long. And it does have some the caveats. If you gotta like, it's gotta be there. They could you could never scale it up into like a TV setting. It has to kind of be this. You're directly on. I don't use I don't use the 3D setting yeah. on my 3DS, and I, I mean, quite frankly, uh, my kid got a 2DS, and I would prefer to have it. Yeah, I know a lot of people that made that switch. Yeah. I mean, I, I like the the two the 2D or the or, or whatever, not the DS version, mm -hmm. but the the uh, the one that was just the it had the two screens on it, but it was just a 
Yep, it's a single unit. Single unit. Uh, I, I, there are a lot of people who said that was great, but I kind of like the clamshell design of the... Yeah. Of the uh, it makes it a little bit more portable. It also makes it a little bit more resistant to being damaged. Like yeah. it's, if something presses against it, it doesn't crack the screen mm. or something like that. Well, so um, this is the end of Season 2, Episode 17 of the Beer and Broadband Podcast. Um, definitely don't pay any attention to the beginning of this because we totally got our whiskeys all screwed up. But the whiskeys were so good. They were, they were great. Uh, try all of them. Uh, that I think it's what we come away with. Uh, just don't expect them to all be the same. And um, other than that, we'll catch you next time. Have a great one.